Well, hello everyone, and welcome to our Thursday noon check-in here at Embrace. My name is Christina, and I'm one of our associate pastors, and I'm grateful to be with you all today. If you're joining us on here live, go ahead and put your name in the comments, say hello, let us know that you're here with us. And if you're watching on repeat after the fact, we're really glad that you have found this stream and joined us as well. I will go ahead and tell you that if you are willing and able, now would be a great time to share the stream. We've connected with all sorts of new folks throughout this strange pandemic season um, because of these Facebook live streams and because people have shared. So we've even gotten to meet some of those folks in person now that we've done some outdoor services, and that's been a real gift. But also, we've been able to have people from different states and even different countries join us because we're able to share the stream um, in lots of different places. So if you are comfortable doing that today, I invite you just to hit the share button. You can write a post or just share it really quickly, um, and hopefully we'll have some other folks who can find us and join us that way. But I am grateful for this time to be together that we set aside every week, and I'm grateful for those of you who come and interact with one another. I'll just remind you that the comments is one of the best things about this Facebook Live platform because it lets us interact and it lets you talk to one another and share what you think about what's being shared during the check-in. And so I'll just encourage you to take advantage of those comments. And please, especially also use them for your prayer requests. We always want to pray together during these check-ins on Thursday. That's how we end every check-in. And so if you are on here live with us, then please add your prayer request anytime. You can do it now or you can do it later. We'll pray together at the end. Um, but we would love to partner with you in prayer today for whatever is on your heart. And if you're watching this after the fact, you can still comment your prayer and we'll see it. Or you can always email prayer requests anytime to prayer at embraceyourcity.com. And our prayer team will keep it confidential, but be partnering with you and lifting you up in prayer. So please do take advantage of those opportunities. Prayer is one of the most powerful ways that we can be united together in spirit, even when we are not together physically. And so I just want to share a couple of announcements as we get started here today. Um, mostly just remind you of our weekly schedule at this point. So on Sunday mornings, we now have two different worship service opportunity options. At 9 a.m., we have an outdoor service on the Embrace lawn. So if you came to any of our Wednesday on the lawn services, it's in the same spot, and it's kind of a similar setup, um, and we've really enjoyed spending time together outside. It is getting a little bit colder um, and the weather does impact our ability to have that service outside. So if we get rained out or it's just too impossibly cold, we will cancel and let you guys know. But otherwise, we will be out on the lawn together at 9 a.m. And then even if it's bad weather and we have to cancel that service, we will always have our 11 a.m. online service. So that'll happen every week, um, no matter what. You can count on that to join us here at 11 a.m. So 9 and 11 are our Sunday opportunities. Monday at 4 p.m., we pray together and share with one another how we're doing and how we can be lifting each other up on Zoom. And I share that link in our Embrace Community Facebook group. And so if you want to be involved and you're not yet, just shoot me an email um, or you can comment on here and I'll add you. But my email is Christina with a K at EmbraceYourCity.com. And then on Thursdays at noon, like right now, we have these check-ins. And so the check-ins look different um, and they're gonna continue to look different. We're gonna have some more different faces on here, um, each doing a check-in during the month. And they can be anything from music to uh, conversation about current issues or Bible study. And today our time together is gonna be a little bit more Bible study focused. And I'm really excited about that actually, because we're gonna to get to cover a scripture today that we might otherwise have missed in our Exodus series. And so if you've been following along with the lectionary, then you know that there is one more week of Exodus texts that have been provided for us. But Dustin said on Sunday when he was preaching the golden calf story and did a great job with that, that that was the end of our Exodus series. And he was right. And that's because we're about to begin a 1 Thessalonians series this Sunday. We're moving to the New Testament lectionary text, and it'll be 1 Thessalonians starting this week and for the next four weeks after that. So that we could start at the beginning of 1 Thessalonians, we ended Exodus a week early, but we're going to talk about that Exodus passage, which is Exodus 33, during our time here together today. So Exodus 33 moves us from the story of the golden calf, which in lots of ways is a really tragic story, and into a story that some of us might have heard and might remember 
where Moses asks God to show him his glory. And so that's where we're going to spend some time digging in today before we move on to 1 Thessalonians on Sunday. And so I am really excited personally to talk about the Exodus 33 passage because it's one that has meant a lot to me for a long time. At different times in my life, I've encountered these verses and been encouraged by the responsiveness of God to Moses, as well as the intimacy that God is obviously willing to have with him. I've always really loved the image of God setting Moses in the cleft of a rock and covering him with his hand so that he would be protected as God's glory passes by. This motion feels gentle and protective and intimate to me. And so in all my encounters with Exodus 33, I've been encouraged and walked away feeling hopeful and loved. And that's been when I have approached this passage devotionally. But there is a difference between approaching scripture devotionally, sitting with the words and asking the Holy Spirit to highlight a specific set of words or a specific part of the text to really speak to your spirit, and then reading to study a passage. And I believe encountering scripture in both ways is really powerful and we need both kinds of engagement, devotional and study, in our scriptural diets. And so though I've spent time in this passage repeatedly, I think I can honestly say that my preparation for our time together today is the first time I have studied this passage, which means I encountered a whole bunch of new insights and it has meant something new to me this time that I'm excited to share together. And I don't think I have ever paid as much attention to the context of this passage or the real content of what Moses is actually saying to God as I have been able to do this time because I've engaged in the discipline of study. And so I want to share the fruit of that together today. And the first thing I think it's incredibly important for us to note about Exodus 33 is that it not only follows Exodus 32 chronologically, but it's also directly connected in content. So we must keep the reality of the Israelites' sin with the golden calf in front of us to really understand what is happening here in Exodus 33. At the end of Exodus 32, the relationship between God and the Israelites is a mess. How they move forward, and even if they can move forward, is as of yet uncertain and unclear. We do know that God relented when Moses begged him not to blot the people off the face of the earth as punishment for their sin. But even so, a purge of the people has just taken place and a plague has spread throughout the Israelite camp as a consequence of the sin. In many ways, Exodus 32 is an ugly and uncomfortable account to read and imagine and wrap our minds around. But at the start of Exodus 33, in the middle of this mess and strained relationship, God speaks. He presents to Moses his decision about how he and the people of Israel will move forward now. So let's hear these first three verses together. Then the Lord said to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go with you, because you are a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. So there's a few things we need to notice in this passage right off the bat. In these words, God has referred to the ancestral promise he made, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he lists them off again, and he tells us that he intends to keep it. He's going to give the land that he promised to those ancestors. But we also hear God's statement of intent to personally distance himself from the people while he is fulfilling this promise. And to help us really understand the significance of God's statement, we need to remember back, not all that far, to our sermon series on Genesis. While we studied Genesis, Pastor John helped to distill the ancestral promise for us into a three-part promise. He told us that Abraham's descendants were promised to be numerous, that they would have their own land, and that God would be with them. In the most boiled down terms then, the ancestral promise was for descendants, land, and presence. That means what God says to Moses at the beginning of Exodus 33 sets off alarm bells for Moses and for the rest of the people. 
because they all know the promise has three parts. But God has just declared he's only going to fulfill the first two parts. See, Israel is already a numerous people. They grew large while they were slaves in Egypt, which is why the Egyptians were afraid of them. So that's part one of the promise already fulfilled. Now God says he's going to give them the land he promised. So that's part two. But God is removing the promise of his presence from the deal. The text next tells us that Moses shares God's words with the people and a great mourning spreads throughout the camp. Somehow, this proposed sanitized experience of promise fulfillment feels empty and hollow. And I'd imagine that the judgment of God about these people, that they are stiff-necked and provoking destruction, might just feel hopeless as Moses relays it to them. But determined leader that he is, Moses goes back to God. He sets out to encounter Yahweh in the tent of meeting, where he always speaks to God, face to face as if to a friend, verse 11 says. And in that intimate place, Moses declares some bold words. First, he calls to mind the Lord's favor for him personally, requesting that if God really is pleased with Moses, then he will continue to teach him his ways. And also, to remember that this nation Moses is charged with leading is God's special people. It's almost as if Moses is saying, You are pleased with me, God. You've said so. So please keep teaching me. Oh, and by the way, while you aren't giving up on me, please also don't give up on all these other people who belong to you. The Lord replies to Moses, and it sounds like the problem is solved. I will go with you, and I will give you rest, God says. And yet, it's easy to miss the subtlety of the Hebrew grammar in our English translation. Walter Brueggemann points out that the you in God's response is singular, only one you, and it's very purposefully singular. Moses has asked God to remember him and all the people. God has agreed to associate with Moses alone. And so Moses presses in and is bold yet again. And he says these words, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? Here, we see that Moses is not only bold, but also that he has a deep humility in his words. Moses is recognizing the need of the people for God first and foremost. God's presence is not just one part of the promise. According to Moses, it's the only part that really matters. If not your presence, Lord, then what will we have to make us different than anybody else in the whole world? Other nations are numerous. Other nations have their own land. Other nations do not have Yahweh. Your people are nothing, God, without you. And so here... On the backside of the incredible failure of the people to keep God first, to allow him and him alone to be their God without trying to box him in or make an idol out of him, Moses declares with humility and conviction that God alone is enough and the blessing of his presence matters more than any other material blessing God could give them. This is so powerful. And so God responds. In response to Moses' humble, Ten Commandments compatible faith, God agrees to keep the full ancestral promise to his people, all three parts. He would have offered the material blessings alone, but his people would have still been truly poor. Only as the special possession, the nation of priests, do these people have an identity and a purpose in the world. The presence of God, the connection to him, and the identity of being his own is what matters most. Friends, how often do we actually pause and humble ourselves before the Lord long enough to confess that his presence is what matters most to us, that he alone is enough for us? How often do we assess our hope and affections and determine whether out of all of the good things he could and does give us, out of all of the ways we long to see kingdom shape change in this world, is he still what matters most? Being his and being with him 
Does that matter most to us? That's a question to sit with this week, isn't it? And though we could stop here in this passage, because the boldly humble, insistent faith of Moses has already challenged us deeply, the conversation between Moses and God continues. Amazingly, even after God has already agreed to keep the whole three-part promise and not withhold himself, Moses makes one more bold ask of God. Now, he says, show me your glory. And it's a little bit perplexing to try and grasp what's going on here. Is Moses feeling super confident all of a sudden? His boldness has been rewarded with the outcome he sought. So maybe he's just going to keep making big asks until God finally says no. Is that what's happening here? Maybe to some degree. Maybe from Moses we learn that it's okay to ask God big things, to ask for good things. But there's also something else happening here that is deeply rooted to the whole story of Israel. When Moses asks to see God's glory, he is asking God to make an appearance to him in a distinctive way. When God appears in some sort of mystical event, some type of seemingly physical form in the midst of this temporal world, we call it a theophany. That's the fancy theological name. But that's exactly what Moses is asking for here. And his request makes total sense. Because when God reaffirmed the ancestral promise to the patriarchs in Genesis, there was a theophany, a mystical, often nighttime, but veiled in some way, appearance of God. To affirm his covenant with Abraham, God appeared in the twilight as a smoking pot moving through the slaughtered animals of offering. To Jacob, on the run from Esau, God appeared next to a ladder reaching up into heaven with angels ascending and descending on it. And to Jacob again, on the night he was renamed Israel, God appeared as a stranger in human form, engaged intimately in the struggle of a physical wrestling match. And then even to Moses, when God broke 400 years of silence during the slavery in Egypt of the Israelites, God appeared to Moses to announce his covenantal name, that ancestral connection, in a bush that was on fire but did not burn up. Throughout the history of Israel, when God affirms his covenant and its promises, he shows up in mighty, mystical, and glorious ways. So when Moses asks to see God's glory, he is asking for a theophany, a mystical appearing, to seal the deal. He doesn't just want to hear God say he will keep all parts of the promise, most importantly, his own presence. No, he wants to see God seal the deal in the same way God has always sealed the deal. And though God has every reason to deny this request, he instead agrees. He will not only keep the promises he has made to his people, he will offer his very self, his own glorious appearing, as proof that he keeps his word. And then so God offers Moses the details about how the theophany will go down. And the details themselves are somewhat mysterious, and we don't really need to understand why God has chosen to appear with the parameters that he has. Theophanies are always in some way mysterious, shrouded in mystery. Though God appears, his face is never fully seen. What matters is not the mechanics of the theophanic appearance, but the fact that God agrees after the incredible error and the egregious sin of his people. God agrees to keep his promise and to seal the deal the way he always has. Friends, this is an incredibly important passage. It should challenge and inspire us and send a tingle down to our toes because in the first moment of transgression, after the covenantal agreement of his people to live in freedom according to Yahweh's way, God could have severed the relationship. He could have changed the relationship lessened the degree of access and intimacy, and he almost did that. But instead, he listened to the humble boldness and insistent faith of a man who recognized that nothing mattered more than God's presence, belonging to and being with him. So God decided then and there to continue to give of himself deeply and intimately, no matter what the cost. And at every bend in the road, every egregious sin, every failure of his people ever since, God has made the same choice. 
He has made the same choice in its fullest measure by giving Jesus to be sacrificed on a cross to conquer sin and death once and for all. And he continues to make the same choice to give of himself deeply and intimately with no interruption and no decrease of access to us daily through his indwelling spirit, whether we deserve it or not. You see, God's willing response to Moses' bold request, show me your glory, tells us so much more than just that God loves Moses. It shows us that God is faithful to his promise, to his people, and to his very own character. It shows us that God's mercy triumphs over judgment. Remember, the judgment God made against the people is that they were stiff-necked and they would provoke him to destruction. And he was right. That's who the people were. He was justified in his judgment. But in his mercy, God set that judgment and its accompanying consequences aside and instead continued to journey with his people. Today, we ought to be rocked to our core by the knowledge of the depth of God's mercy. Exodus 33 invites us to renew our hope in the God to whom we pray and to know that he is a God of mercy. And I think that matters right now, maybe more than ever. I don't know about you, but I find myself not sure what to pray a lot these days. And a classic prayer that the church has prayed throughout the ages when there aren't words to offer is simply this, Lord, have mercy. And the beautiful witness of Exodus 33 says that God does and he will, he still will have mercy for us. Even when the world is falling apart around us, even when it is clear that God's people, even his church, even has not lived into the fullness of his ways. Even then we know the depth of God's mercy that he will have mercy for us and for all the world in a way that is deep and sufficient for us. And so I hope that's a word of encouragement to you today. It's been a word of encouragement to me as I have pondered the prayer, Lord, have mercy throughout this season. I love that there's this picture in this conversation between Moses and God, where God had every reason not to be merciful, but he did and he did, he was instead. And that that was kind of a turning point, and it set the trajectory for the whole rest of God's interacting with humanity. God has never unmade that choice. He will always be merciful to us. And so I want us to remember that as we continue to press into this often confusing election season, um, that even if we don't know exactly what to pray on a given day, we can pray, Lord, have mercy. I've prayed that prayer a lot in the face of all of the racial um, tension that we have felt and the heartbreak of the lack of justice, especially in Breonna Taylor's case. And I mean, there's so many more instances of injustice, but I continue to pray myself, God have mercy. And I invite you to pray that along with me and have that picture from Exodus 33 in mind when you do trust and know that God is merciful. But all that said, even though we often don't have words to pray, we do right now in this particular election season, have the gift of words to pray from our friend Felice, who's a member of the Embrace community. She is authoring prayers for us each week. It's a five-week um, kind of prayer emphasis on this election season, and this one is the third week that we're currently in. And so we're going to pray that prayer together right now. I'm going to put it up on the screen so we can read it with one another. But this week's focus is actually asking God for justice in our nation. But alongside justice is always the reality of God's mercy. So I love how in part of Felice's prayer, she asks God to help us know his just mercy. I think that has powerful implications, especially after the Bible study that we have done together today. So I'm going to stop talking and, and give us a moment of silence to prepare. And then let's pray this prayer together. God, who is both Alpha and Omega, Uncertainty and doubt surround us like clouds of dust. Our nation has been shrouded in thick wildfire smoke, covered by waves of injustice, and laid low by the grief of a pandemic. We long to know your just mercy. Show us the way. 
reveal to us where we can find certainty. Help us to trust that your justice can rain down and wash away doubt and despair, making the path ahead clear. Make our trust in the power of the resurrection unshakable, in the face of struggle, pain, and those who wish us harm. We know that hope in you will provide us with the strength we need to walk the path toward justice. Give us a sense of your presence and peace as we struggle to march onward. May we pray for justice without ceasing until you bring your work to completion. Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. Those are beautiful, powerful words, and I'm grateful that you prayed those with me wherever you are today. I invite you to continue to use these beautiful prayer cards from Felice to guide your own prayers in this election season. Uh, we'll share a new one together on Sunday morning in our service and then post it on our Facebook page after that. But I also want to take a moment now that we've prayed that special prayer together and see if there's any requests here in the comments that we can pray for together. Let's see. So Chris shared with us that an inmate in Idaho named Keith sent a prayer request to him um, for him and his grandmother. Keith is feeling helpless. He just found out that his grandmother has been diagnosed with cancer. That is a heavy, heavy thing to find out, Chris. And we will definitely, let's pray for him right now. Father, we just pray for Keith and for his grandmother as they both deal with this incredibly difficult news. Lord, we just pray that you would breathe hope back into Keith's soul. Lord, that you would give him the strength that he needs to walk with his grandmother in this journey and that you would give medical professionals wisdom as they treat her and deal with her in, um, in this condition that she has. And Lord, we just ask that you would provide fresh insight and that you would give pathways towards healing. And most of all, Lord, that you would just make Keith and his grandmother incredibly aware of your presence with them and your faithfulness to them throughout this journey. Amen. And we'll continue praying with you in that, Chris. Thanks for sharing. Darlene says she'll be praying as well. John is praising that God's mercy triumphs over judgment. Amen. And then Sally wants us to pray for national strikes in Costa Rica. I'm always grateful, Sally, when you can join us and share what's going on in your portion of the world. And we want to partner with you in prayer for these strikes and also for your ministry. And so, Heavenly Father, I just pray for Sally and for all those who work with Hearts and Hands for Jesus and who are in their community. Lord, we pray for their safety right now in the midst of this political upheaval. Lord, you know the specific um, requests of the strikers and you know um, the levels of need that are present among these people. And Lord, we just pray that you would rise, raise up the community and help them to intervene. And Lord, we pray that as these national strikes happen, that you would keep people safe um, and help them to, to bind together and to look towards you, Lord. It's easy in, in political uprising, especially to feel division and to give way to division. But Lord, we pray for a spirit of unity and peace among the people who claim your name and who are yours. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your presence with Sally and all those in her community and in the country of Costa Rica today. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So if there are any other prayer requests that you'd like to share with us throughout the week, please do remember to do that. And please pray for each other. I saw several of you saying that you would pray with Chris and with Sally. And I'm grateful for that because we are the church, friends. And if we pray, we pray together and God hears us. And I'm so incredibly honored to be part of this family that we call Embrace and to have spent this time together with you today. So with that, I want to wrap up our time together and send you out and pray that you have a blessed rest of your week. Look forward to joining with you if you can be with us on Sunday at 9 a.m. outside or 11 a.m. here on Facebook Live. Love you all. Thank you. Goodbye.